I'll tell you, friend, the origin of revival rests not in man, but rests in God the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God alone can originate revival. We need to invite the Spirit of God back into the church. We need to invite the Spirit of God back into our lives. The church of Jesus Christ is largely sleeping like a great bedroom. And you have all the Christians in bed and they're all sleeping. And they're saying, please, don't wake me up. I want to sleep off. And of course, when God starts to operate a revival, people cannot sleep. You can't sleep in church when the Spirit of God awakes the people. Look at the first verse of this 52nd chapter. Awake! Awake! Put on strength! Wake it up, you sleepy Christian! Awake, all that sleep us! Arise from the dead! Christ will give you life! Why should a person embrace death with Christ? Why should a person be willing to go in identification down to the cross and into the tomb and up again? I'll tell you why. Because it's the only way that God can get glory out of a human being. When God stepped out, suddenly, men and women all over the parish were gripped by the fear of God. The Holy Spirit began to move among the people. What was that? Revival! Revival! Not an evangelist, not a special effort, not anything at all organized on the basis of human endeavor, but an awareness of God that gripped the whole community, so much so that work stopped. And uh, the minister, writing about what happened in the following morning, said this, You met God on Meadow and Moorland. You met him in the homes of the people. God seemed to be everywhere. The praying and the meetings continued for several months. Until one night, a very remarkable thing happened. There, kneeling among straw in the barn, when suddenly one young man rose and read part of Psalm 24. Who shall ascend the hill of God? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart to have not lifted up his soul to vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing of the Lord. And he shut his Bible, and then looking down at the minister and at the other men who were kneeling there, he began to pray, God, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? And that dear man got no further. He fell on his knees. And then on his face among the straw, and he prayed, prayed, and prayed again. I'm standing beside him for about five minutes. And then the door of the church opened, and the session clerk came in. Mr. Campbell, something wonderful has happened. Revival has broken out. Will you come to the door and see the crowd that's here? Eleven o'clock, Matthew. Eleven o'clock. And I went to the door and there must have been a congregation of between six and seven hundred people gathered round the church. And in the midst of it, I could hear the cry of the penitent. I could hear men crying to God for mercy. And within a matter of minutes, the church was crowded at a quarter to twelve. Now, where did the people come from? How did they know that a meeting was in progress in the church? Well, I cannot tell you. But I know this, that from village and hamlet, the people came. Were you to ask some of them today, what was it that moved you? They couldn't tell you. Only that they were moved by a power that they could not explain. And the power was such as to give them to understand and see that they were held deserving sinners. And of course,
house, the only place they could think of where they might find help was at the church. So I endeavored to get up into the pulpit. I found the way blocked with young people who had been at the dance. When I went into the pulpit, I found a young woman, a graduate of Aberdeen University, who was at the dance. And she's lying on the floor of the pulpit crying, Is there mercy for me? Is there mercy for me? Is there mercy for me? God was at work. Thank God, people need it to be awakened. It is today. Spirit of God operates by awaking people. And then when they're awakened, when God's people are awakened, this fire of prayer starts to burn. There's nothing so dead as a dead prayer meeting. There's nothing more alive than a live prayer meeting. You ought to feel life in your soul. Then get into an old-fashioned, white-hot prayer meeting where men are praying. And they're not stringing sentences together. And they're not saying the old things that you're sick hearing in prayer meetings. Oh, no. They're praying. They're pleading with God. They're crying to God. Sometimes it's a groan. Sometimes it's a tear. Sometimes it's a broken sentence. Sometimes it's a sigh. But it's prayer. All true passion is born out of anguish. All true passion for Christ comes out of a baptism of anguish. Folks, let me tell you something. Out of this baptism of anguish comes a marvelous thing that happens to those willing to submit to it. A marvelous thing. It's the instant, prompt knowing of God's voice. Instant. Now see, if you don't have a history of prayer, if you don't have this willingness to share God's heart, you get it by asking Him for it. He said, I'll, I'll give. I'm more willing to give you our receive. This is something you ask. Oh God, I, I, I want to step out now and I want to know your heart. I'm going to say to you, dear friend, if you're out here without Christ, you come to Jesus Christ and serve Him as long as you live, whether you go to hell at the end of the way, because He's worthy. I say to you, Christian friend, you come to the cross and join him in union and death and enter into all the meaning of death to self in order that he can have glory. There are numbers among us that are changing and they don't know it. You've lost your fight. That's all the devil wants to do is get the fight out of you and kill it. So you won't labor in prayer anymore. You won't weep before God anymore. You can sit and watch television and your family go to hell. What is thunder and lightning? Well, according to the psalmist and according to the Bible everywhere, thunder and lightning are but a kind of indication of God's power. The God who said at the beginning, let there be light, and there was light. Well, now, he just gives you an indication of what his power is in the flash of the lightning, the roar of the thunder. These are but glimpses of God's might, God's power, God's eternal ability. Very well. A revival, I say, is just a kind of touch of his God, a fleeting glimpse of something of what he is in and of himself. And I'm emphasizing this, my dear friends, because you and I must come to realize that these things are possible and these things are meant for us. We were never meant to be content with a little. We were never meant to be content with a little.